All right, that's my cue, guys. What is going on? I appreciate y'all having me back. I'm really excited to be back. Um, this is a whole lot of fun last time. And uh, I actually have a microphone this time, which will make things hopefully a little more tolerable. And uh, last time when I went and listened back, I said, um, a lot. So I'm going to try and keep that to a minimum as well. But I appreciate all the questions. Uh, I was trying to go through these throughout the day. And um, uh, there, there's some really good stuff. And I'm getting excited for the season. A lot more actionable stuff at this point rather than looking at individual player evaluation. But um, so my name is Blake Hampton. If you don't know me, uh, before last time I was here, I was with the Undroppables. Now I am with FTN Network, Fade the Noise, uh, started by Jeff Radcliffe and uh, Brad Evans. I am doing a lot of football stuff. I've kind of made a transition into soccer stuff as well. Uh, so I'm able to take on both of those at the same time. You can find me on Twitter at Blake A. Hampton. Um, all my content's going to be at ftnfantasy.com. You should go check it out. There's a lot of really good stuff. I mean, people are cranking out like three, four articles a day right now on just good, actionable content. Um, my DMs are always open if you have any questions. So feel free to ask any follow-ups there. If I don't get to yours today, there's a lot of stuff. So we're going to have to start plowing through this here. Um, so first one, to go ahead and just get rolling uh, from – my good friend, Space Ghost Force, uh, it seems like the entire community is Allen Robinson or Bobby Tree's hype, and you're now convinced they're not actually underrated anymore. Why is your pick for most underrated wide receiver, Emmanuel Sanders? Yeah, so on Twitter uh, the other day, there was a question on who is the most underrated wide receiver in the NFL, and I would say that probably about 80% of the responses were either Allen Robinson and uh, Robert Woods. And so I guess my question is, if everyone thinks that they're underrated, are they truly underrated? I guess my answer would be no at this point, because now we've gotten to a point where we're seeing Allen Robinson at like the third, fourth round in a lot of these leagues. And I think it's very well deserved. We see Robert Woods now being talked about as a wide receiver one option if you're going RB heavy at the beginning. So those really aren't underrated in terms of wide receivers, in my opinion, for, for what they are capable of achieving and where they're being taken. Manuel Sanders, he's kind of... He, Honestly, I, I'm not hearing much talked about him. And he's been a player who's had, I think it was like four or 5,000 yard seasons in a row. He was so unbelievable in Denver. And then all of a sudden he goes to San Francisco. The one thing that people say to stray away from is wide receivers that are switching teams. And he does it mid season. And he still is a huge fantasy contributor going to a San Francisco team. I know that Kyle Shannon's a really good coordinator, but I mean, Emmanuel Sanders was a wide receiver too at that point and someone that you wanted to start on. San Francisco. And now he goes to a team in New Orleans who is going to be really have a lot of volume in terms of passing attack. And he's good enough to be able to draw his targets away from other players. And so he's, he's not really someone that I'm seeing being talked about as a potential option and someone who's going to get probably a decent number of volume on a good offensive team. So I think in terms of underrated, uh, someone that's going in the late 30s, early 40s for a wide receiver, I think Emmanuel Sanders is probably one of the most underrated players uh, in redraft, at least, and I guess total wide receiver in general. Um, Dom, FFL, do you believe in the phrase injury prone? I appreciate all the injury questions. I saw these as I was going. I'm not an injury expert. I don't know a whole lot about it. Um, I, I would... I would uh, recommend you to Adam Hutchinson if you would like to know questions about injuries. Um, I personally do not account injury too much in my personal analysis. I guess I subconsciously think about it if I'm making a decision, but at the end of the day, I'm not focusing a ton on the injury side of things. Um, you were high on Robinson and Sutton last time you came by. Have your opinions changed on either tart? Um, okay, so I'm really excited because the Sutton – train is starting to take off here people are really starting to get on board uh news out of training camp is that sutton has been unstoppable and the defense hasn't been able to stop him at all and my question is why is anyone surprised at this point he was unbelievable um having in he's in the top 10 percent in yards per team passing attempts last year on a team that didn't have a whole lot of options but he was dominant on with a new quarterback and he is now 
and the, the big concerns about the rookie target competition and the thing that I responded with, and I think I talked about it last time is that rookie wide receivers have at most a 30% chance to hit in the NFL. And it's even a lower probability when you're talking about their rookie season with someone who has such a high dominated rating with such a significant yards for team passing attempts and a quarterback who's really going to be on a short leash this year. If Drew Locke with all the weapons that Denver invested for him, if he doesn't perform, this season he's going to get pulled and you saw a real chemistry between him and Cortland Sutton towards the end of last year and for him to keep his job he's going to have to be successful and you saw the most success when Drew Locke was passing into Cortland Sutton so with his significant uh weighted opportunity performance rating with his uh, incredible dominator I mean those are the most predictive indicators of future success so uh, I'm really glad to see that he is Looking so good in camp and kind of justifying my formers there. Um, Robinson, we kind of talked about a little bit before. He, what can I say? He he's going to get 140 to 150 targets. And last season, he should have, based on his receiver air conversion ratio in the past, based on his previous uh, average depth of target, those are pretty su sustainable metrics. And so, if you combine his weighted opportunity performance rating, his 150 targets with his typical average at the target. He should have had 1,600 yards last year. So if Nick Foles gets in the game or if Mr. Bisky can step up at all, he has so much room to grow into that role. And he's going to get those targets because there's no one else really there. Anthony Miller does not scare me as target competition. And other than that, they don't have anyone. So uh, Allen Robinson, all aboard there. I'm really happy that his ADP is – well, I'm not happy his ADP has climbed, but it's very much justified. How long uh, – from Freddie Airmail. How long do you wait to see consistent performance from a free agent before picking them up? What factors like lease size tend to affect that decision? So I'm, th th this is some of the stuff that I'm kind of looking into here is waivers and how we're treating the free agent pool during the season. And some of the trends that I've really noticed that I, I guess I kind of thought about subconsciously, but I never really thought about how to create this as actionable information. So what happens in the draft is that people are picking up handcuffs, right? And so I hate drafting handcuffs. I think you're wasting roster spot and you're wasting some upside if you're drafting a handcuff. But what ends up happening is that the handcuff ends up getting dropped about three, four weeks into the season. And so there are all these handcuffs that are going to end up being on the waivers towards the back end of the season. And on the front end of the season, what ends up happening is you have wide receivers that break out week one or two that are sitting on your waivers. And then those are, those guys are picked up. So like last year is Terry McLaurin and DJ shark. And so you're going to have players like that who are going to break out week one and two. And so I would say when, when, when you're looking at players to pick up in free agents, my best actionable advice would be if you see a wide receiver that breaks out, that is a young player that looks like it could be a potential breakout candidate, hop on that player week one or two, get that player. And then what you want to do is save some of your fab uh, or your waiver claim until the back end of the season when you have some of these major running backs going down and then you can pick up your handcuff. So that's kind of the way that I'm approaching waivers this year because you're going to have random wide receivers who are going to break out and you want to make sure you jump on them so you can have potentially league winning wide receivers in quote uh, on your roster after week one or two. So that's kind of what I'm looking at. I don't know if I'm waiting to see consistent performance or that player is going to get scooped up. You're going to be sad that someone else has them on their roster. David Johnson, per recent looks, has been really fluid and explosive in his workouts. Do you think this translates to a strong year without injuries and a new system for him, or are you still cautious? As I said, I'm not an injury expert. Um, I know the upside that David Johnson brings. I know that Bill O'Brien is statistical and he is going to want to prove people wrong on the deandre hopkins thing and so i think that they're going to run him into the ground and the thing about that too is i think that he's going to be on the field and duke johnson's going to be on the field as well because they're really going to have limited receiving options i think duke johnson you're going to see him lining a lot in the slot he was actually the highest slot percentage running back in the nfl last season which is kind of counterintuitive to what people typically thought the houston texans ran Typically, they thought that Houston Texans running backs don't play in the slot, but uh, Duke Johnson was one of the highest uh, in terms of slot or slot snap percentage. That's kind of tough to say. So with all that said, I think David Johnson's going to see a significant snap share. I think he's going to get a high workload. I think that 
the, the only question that I really have is how often is uh, Deshaun Watson going to target him? And so I, I don't know if I have that answer. Obviously, David Johnson is one of the best pass catchers in the NFL in terms of running backs. I mean, he can line up in the slot as well. So uh, I, I like David Johnson about where he's going. Um, that entire tier is just really gross in general of running backs. Um, he's not someone that I have a lot of because I'd much rather take wide receiver in that range. So I guess a, that's a long-winded way of me saying I think if I had to put money down, I don't think that he will get close to what his career ceiling has been. I think he'll be a fairly average running back on a good team. So that's about where I'm at at David Johnson. All right, ground fish. Which Steelers wide receiver, if any, are you taking at their ADP? Do you think Big Ben can return to his old form after his most recent injury? Uh, that was by Groundfish. Thanks for the question. I think that the question, those two kind of tie in with each other, right? Do I think Big Ben can return to his old form after his most recent injury kind of ties in with the wide receiver performances? So my answer is no. I don't think that he'll return to his old form. I don't think he's going to be airing it out a ton. I think that's a pretty significant injury for someone that's his age and someone who's not typically like in shape. And so what I do, and this is going to be kind of a consistent theme with a lot of this stuff, because there are a lot of situations right now where there's not necessarily like a standout one. And, you know, Juju Smith-Schuster, he, he is the wide receiver one on that team. But a lot of people have been talking about the DeAndre Johnson hype. A lot of people have been talking about James Washington potentially breaking out, which I think will actually occur. Some people have been talking about James or, uh, Chase Claypool. And so when you get into this situation where there's a lot of potential options and a lot of different players who are going to potentially break out, the best way I do that is I want to get the cheapest player. Um, between those that have the potential of breaking out. Because then what happens is you're getting the best value on those players that are breaking out. So with, in that situation, it's going to be James Washington. And I like James Washington a lot. He He's not necessarily a player that people are getting too excited about, but his average at the target has been insane. And his yards per route run looked really good last year, um, both in the top 50 in the NFL. And his opportunity and he was doing all this and he kind of had a mini breakout towards the end of the year where he had two 100 yard games with quarterback Doug, with Devlin Hodges and so when you're talking about a mini breakout with a quarterback who is not even like I, I don't Devlin Hodges on the team anymore I think so but it, I mean you're, you're gonna have a much better quarterback situation so I said in ambiguous situations when there is a wide receiver one, but it's kind of muddy on all these potential breakout candidates. I'm always going to shoot for the lowest or I guess the cheapest one in that sense, because you're going to have the biggest potential return there when you're drafting that type of player. Where do you agree and disagree with your FTN coworkers on fantasy football players? Can you give us a couple examples in redraft and dynasty? So this kind of goes along with what I was just saying. So most people, they are avoiding ambiguous situations. So they don't necessarily want to take on a gross, back, muddy backfields to where there's not really uh, a lead running back back there. So uh, Washington, for instance. So Miami, for instance. So um, I guess the 49ers are kind of becoming that where you're not really sure what's going on there with Raheem Mostert. And I like this both from a redraft and dynasty perspective, because what you can do is you can capitalize on the ambiguity. You can get the cheapest player that's going to be there and they have as high of a probability of breaking out as maybe some of those that are going even higher. So for instance, at one point for the 49ers, it was Jared McKinnon. Right. I mean, you, you get Jared McKinnon with the 350th pick and now all of a sudden news is coming out of training camp that he could, you know, have a significant workload on the team. And so now he's getting jumping up into the 250s. And if he gets some opportunity, he's going to get even higher and higher. So you, you draft him in this back end in terms of ambiguity. And then all of a sudden they just keep rising and rising. And you're going to start getting this increasing value over time. And so that's what you're going to have happen with Matt Breida this year with the Miami Dolphins. Jordan Howard's the most expensive one right now. And so you get Matt Breida, and then essentially he's going to take over the workload at some point, and you're going to get 
you know, a really good player there at some point. So um, that, that's kind of where I dis or where uh, disagreements are with me and my FTN coworkers. A lot of people don't want to take on that ambiguity, but I like to take advantage of those kind of as cheaper discount options that are eventually going to be potential breakout candidates. That's one of the best way to spot young breakout candidates is uh, muddled in that ambiguity in some of these rosters. From John Snow, is COVID affecting your drafting strategy at all? For example, would you try to avoid drafting players from the same team, even if it means losing a bit of value, since we all know that all it takes is one guy to mess up an entire team? So COVID is so, I mean, it's so unpredictable, obviously. And we don't really know what all is going to happen throughout the year. So I think if you're trying to take COVID into account in your drafting strategy, I think you're overthinking it. I'm, I'm personally not taking in, in terms of what I'm doing as a, um, as like the league manager, I'm adding additional IR spots uh, for uh, players that may get COVID throughout the year. If there's any situations that's going on, uh, I reduce the league fees for my home league this year uh, in terms of the economic crisis that's going on. Um, but anyways, all that aside, in terms of my actual strategy, I'm not doing anything. Uh, that is in terms of my draft strategy that is going along with COVID. I know that some people are thinking that um, you know, if players get COVID, they'll have antibodies. Um, I'm not buying into that narrative by any means. So um, yeah, I'm not doing much with it at the moment. Okay, as a rebuilding team in Dynasty, do you typically sell rookies with hype for more assets or hope they hit their ceiling? Example, Gibson. Okay. So rebuilding is an art. There's a few different ways that you can do this. And so my favorite way to personally rebuild is to accrue as many um, rookie picks as possible. And so, I mean, obviously that, that involves trading away a lot of you know, players that you may have left. But the thing about rookie picks and what you want to do is you want to get them prior. So you want to get them like the year before. So you want to start getting 2021 rookie picks at the moment, uh, 2021, 2022 rookie picks. I know it seems like a long ways away, but what you're doing is you're getting them at their cheapest form. And the thing about rookie picks is they are the only thing in fantasy football that sustain their value or they grow in value, right? So that 2021 first isn't going to necessarily decrease in value over time. It's always going to be a 2021 first. Um, I guess the only way that that could really reconcile is if depending on where that's going to end up at, but hopefully you know where that 2021 pick is going to be just kind of based off the individual's roster construction on what that is. So that should be something that you're taking into account when you're getting these picks. But other than that, key picks don't devalue necessarily and so and players do devalue so i'm always trying to accrue as many rookie picks as i can and then you want to take a look at these rookie picks you want to take a look at your roster and then based on your drafting so one of my uh rosters i did i, I ended up trading away most of my rookie picks uh to build out a, a new team and build out you know young good players and stuff because i, I already know that those players are going to end up being good um, for an example, like you're saying, where you're talking about Antonio Gibson, I guess it's kind of a case-by-case -case situation. If you have a young, talented team and you have a potential to grow into that, then I would certainly hold on to uh, Gibson and see where that goes. If you're not even close, not even a little bit close, and you see Gibson is going for like a rookie first-round pick or something like that, totally capitalize on that. So it, it's kind of a case-by-case -case situation, but... Um, that's where I would head with it. Doing a startup, uh, this is from Moncal. When doing a startup, when do you begin to consider running backs that likely only have another year or two of decent production? Guys like James Conner, MG3, Fournette, or Gurley. Would you consider taking them before or after stocking up on younger wide receivers who may not be startable in year one? Okay, so... I think that those running backs are the most overvalued in Dynasty. And I I love running backs in terms of fantasy football production. And I, I, I'm a 
I was just joking the other day when I said I'm a zero RB guy. I love robust running back. And the issue right now that we're having is that the tiers between your running back one and your running back two, they are diverging. While your tiers between your wide receiver one, your wide receiver two, and all these wide receiver tiers, they're converging. So all those are becoming much closer together. All the running backs are becoming much farther apart. And so when you're talking about these running backs who are kind of in like a second tier, well, yeah, they're in the second tier, but that's so far differential from your first tier. And these guys, they could fall off a cliff tomorrow in terms of their production. And so when you're talking about stocking up on younger wide receivers, those are the most valuable players in Dynasty because they accrue value at a very high sustaining rate. See DJ Moore, see Chris Godwin, see DJ Shark, see Cortland Sutton. All these players have potential to break out that may not have been there for that year one. Um, so at this point, I would highly consider stocking up on younger wide receivers um, for Dynasty rather than take a shot on one of those guys um, just for purely that reason. DJ Weez. So being a zero RB truther like myself, I'm sorry for uh, lying about my zero RB truther. Uh, who would you need to fall to the third, fourth for you to change it up? Sticking with zero RB from picks one through 12. Uh, where do you find it to be most effective, early, mid, or late? I've been having success at 12 in mocks personally. So as I said, I don't personally recommend zero RB. And as I was mentioning before, it, it you're, you're talking about this uh, tier conversion, diversion um, between the positional groups. And so you're starting to see the uh, elite wide receivers. Oh, sorry. My, my wife came in here. Um, so you start to see the really good wide receivers all start to clump into this single tier. And then the running backs, as I said, the, the much better ones, they're going in the front end. That's why all these running backs are going picks one through six, and you're not seeing a wide receiver taken until Michael Thomas. And so if you're wanting to go uh, kind of a zero RB strategy, I would highly recommend, as you said, going in the back half of that first round, um, picks 11 through 12. I personally hate 12 because – when you're in the back half, you're kind of having to set the tone. You really don't know what anyone what's going to come back to you on the back end. There could be like this massive running back run uh, in the second and third round, and then all of a sudden you're left with absolutely nothing on that back half. So um, I, I would recommend, you know, like a 10, 12 range if you're wanting to go zero RB. Uh, that, that's just kind of where I would personally see value with not having to be uh, kind of on that back-to-back -back picks uh, there. So... Um, that, that's that's kind of where I go with that. Okay. Ground fish. Does Alex Smith stand a chance to usurp Haskins um, and reclaim a starting position for the Washington football team? Assuming he does not, what expectations do you have for the sophomore quarterback this season? Uh, sorry for the injury questions. So I think that they would be ridiculous for not starting Haskins the whole season because they have so much draft equity in Haskins. And so he's a young quarterback, and he's going to uh, have some growing pains. But if they don't play him the whole season, they're not going to know what they have in him. They don't really have a good football team as it is. I think that Washington's going to be horrible this year. Um, the only piece that I really want there is Terry McLaurin. And so I think as much as I like Alex Smith as a player and as a person, um, I – unless there's an injury or something like that, I, I don't see any situation where Washington should or would uh, play Alex Smith, but you never know. Okay. Um, Gurnals, who's your favorite running back to take at the one turn? So 2-12, 3-1. Um, so there are... Um, there are a few players that I'm really interested in at that point um, in terms of running back. So there seems to be a few players that are kind of falling right now. So Nick Chubb is kind of falling. I, I know that he got a concussion. I don't think he's going to fall that far to you um, in terms of running backs around that range. Um, but 
I'm I'm really interested for redraft. I, I know this is kind of contradicting what I was saying earlier, but for for redraft, I really like um, some of these more uh, high volume running backs that you know. Uh, so Leonard Fournette. I know there's been a lot of hate towards Leonard Fournette. And I know uh, that's not a very popular topic right now um, on that end, but people are thinking that he's not going to get as much volume last year. But when you look at the situation there, I mean, they were out of the Jaguars were out of the playoffs week 15 and 16. Um, they were five and 10 at that point. And uh, they had every opportunity to play Radical Armstead and they still ran Leonard Fournette 20 times in that game. And they gave Radical Armstead uh, two rushes and he got like 10 yards on it. And then there was one game where Leonard Fournette was out and then Radical Armstead and Divine Ozzie Bo uh, combined for 12 carries between the two. And so I really like Leonard Fournette in the third round um, as much, even though Evan Silva said that that determines who's the dumbest person in your draft is the person who drafts Leonard Fournette in the third round. I love Leonard Fournette in the third round. Um, but if there are any of those running backs that are kind of like in the Josh Jacobs, um, uh, Nick Chubb, um, it was once upon a time, Clyde Edwards Hilaire, um, Jonathan Taylor feels like reaching at that point, but that, that's that's kind of that range that I'd be looking for there. My level. Hey, Blake, got a few questions for you, man. Excited to see you Thursday night. Thank you. Excited to see you guys too. Uh, Jonathan Taylor, the kid was electric in college. I hear some good stuff about him. How do you feel about him in redraft formats? Is he a flex option the first few weeks or a running back to caliber player? Uh, Mac is still going to have a role in the offense, but do you trust the Taylor hype? Okay, um, so I'm going to take this one question at a time. I appreciate the two questions. Um, so Jonathan Taylor, so my strategy, if I was going to draft Jonathan Taylor, is I want to make sure I have two running backs in place before I draft him. He's the ultimate lottery ticket player because there's an opportunity that he shares a backfield with Marlon Mack uh, the entire season. Um, but if Jonathan Taylor ends up taking over that backfield week two, you have a lottery ticket and a league winning player right there. Uh, someone who has first round caliber upside. Uh, my uh, simulation uh, player deviation of between uh, differentiating production and athletic profiles has him best comp to uh, Saquon Barkley and Ezekiel Elliott in terms of the type of player he is. Uh, so, I mean, he has that type of upside. He's an athletic freak. He is a much better pass catcher than people think in terms of his uh, market share efficiency with the Wisconsin Badgers uh, in college. So once he takes over that backfield, it's wheels up. It's just when is that going to happen? And so if you're going to draft him in like the fourth round, I would make sure a third, fourth round. I don't, I don't know where he's going at the moment in redraft. I, I haven't done it many mocks, but I would make sure that I have two running backs just for kind of that security blanket there. But it was Hilaire. This guy's stock has rose up so much the past few weeks. We see him going inside the top 10 picks in round one, which is insane. How do you feel about the current ADP? Is he worth the risk or are you not having any shares this season? It's kind of both. I think he's worth the ADP and I'm still not having many shares of him, unfortunately. Um, I've, in all my best ball drafts, I keep getting between picks seven and nine. And uh, so Clyde Edwards Hilaire keeps going like fifth overall in those. And I like Clyde Edwards Edwards Hilaire a lot. I think that in terms of a prospect, he was kind of underrated. He was my number five guy coming into the draft. And then once he gets drafted by the Kansas City Chiefs, you know, it's not necessarily the player at this point. Uh, it's the player with the situation and his differential of talent between him and DeAndre Washington, which I think is significant. So if you you want a piece of that Kansas City offense, you always wanted the Kansas City running back. Uh, players who are going to be there. But now when you're talking about the talent differential between Clyde Edwards, Lair, and DeAndre Washington, that's kind of where you're deciding on how these players' workloads going to shake out. I personally think it's significant. I think a first-round talent is much better than a fifth-round talent who's never been able to beat out Jalen Richard. And so I think Clyde Edwards, Lair is going to get between like 60 and 65% of that Kansas City Chiefs running back offense. And so that in itself, if we believe that running back talent doesn't matter a ton and you're just looking for the player who's getting the opportunities within a certain offense, um, that, that's that's why you draft Clyde edwards Lair there, and I'm totally fine with it. Chase Edmonds, awesome. Um, Chase Edmonds is awesome, actually, and I think he's a really 
good late round running back candidate because I think he's going to have standalone value with that Arizona Cardinals offense. That offense is going to run a lot of plays. And Kenyon Drake, he looked really good last year, but his sample size was so minuscule that any, I mean, you had, as I said, DeAndre Washington looked good for like a four week span last year for the Oakland Raiders. I'm not saying Kenyon Drake is bad. I'm not saying that he's DeAndre Washington, but we don't really know what he's going to end up being. Um, and with so many plays, Chase Edmonds is still going to have a role. And if anything happens to Kenyon Drake or he doesn't end up living up to his big contract that he's being paid there for um, or he gets traded for whatever reason, I mean, Chase Edmonds is really viable to be a starter um, on that team. And I think he's going to soak up a lot of touches with, uh, as I said, it's it's a different differential of talent distribution. I really don't think the talent level between Kenyon Drake and Chase Edmonds is as significant as people are forecasting within projections. Okay, last season uh, from T-Money. Last season, uh, James Winston finished as the number five fantasy QB, even with minus two for interceptions this year. Uh, Tom Brady is being drafted around QB 10, 11, 12. What's up with that? I know he's old for an NFL QB, but we are really not expecting him to be at least as good stat-wise as Jameis freaking Winston. Uh, the answer is no. We're not expecting him to be as good as Jameis Winston because Jameis Winston was throwing the ball like 50, 60 times a game. And... Part of that was because he'd throw two pick sixes to start every single game. They'd be down by 14. He'd have to throw 100 times a game. Uh, Buccaneers, actually, in terms of expected points added, they had one of the best defenses last year. And so James Winston was actually the main reason why they were going down in the game to begin with. That's not going to happen this year. They're going to be in a lot of close games. They're not going to be required as pass as much. It's going to be a much more efficient offense than last year. Um, his the total passes he's going to have is probably going to be closer to like 30, 35 per game, which still is going to give some really good upside to these receivers, but it may not look statistically relevant for Tom Brady every single day. And so, uh, I mean, Jameis Winston was able to finish that high with just a significant, significant volume of passes. Um, as mentioned, this is going to be a much more efficient offense. I don't think you're going to see as many touchdowns. I don't think you're going to see as many yards. Um, I think 10 through 12 uh, is it's probably a good range in terms of like his most probabilistic outcome. But I think, as you mentioned, he does kind of have the upside with the talent that's around him to be able to kind of sneak up into that uh, six to seven range if everything kind of goes right for him. Um, but with no rushing upside or anything else, I don't really see much more than that. Um, Space Ghost Force. Bucks have two new RBs in LaShawn McCoy and Keyshawn Vaughn. The holdovers, Dari Agumbawale and TJ Logan are steady eddies. I'm impressed with their reliability. You seem impressed with Dari, Dynasty stash worthy, redraft, uh, pickup, late draft, dart throw. What would you classify him as? Okay. I love Dari Gumbawale. If you don't follow me on Twitter, at Blake A. Hampton, you can see all my Dari Gumbawale love on there. Um, and so this kind of goes along with what I was saying before. You look for ambiguous situations. You look for a position that hasn't necessarily been established by a number one yet, and you want to capitalize in the players who kind of have the upside to step into that role. Dari Gumbawale had a, um, in terms of a dominator uh, expected point total of 60% in terms of the passing game. And so that actually, and, and so that what that does is that shows how many expected points a player has in certain situations comparatively to the rest of the NFL in standard situations. So Dari Gamboale has 60%, um, and Ronald Jones was down at a 20%. And so Dari Gamboale was 100% the Bucks pass catcher third down running back last season. And so Dari, I mean, you see it, right? Tom Brady is going to be on the field and Ronald Jones misses the pass block. And all of a sudden, Tom Brady is going to be wanting Ronald Jones off the field because he can't protect him. And Dari Gumbawale is a much better uh, pass blocker. He's a much better pass catcher. And last year, he was actually the goal line back too. I think there was an article put out that said uh, Dari Gumbawale had 15 carries last year and eight of them were within the five-yard line. And so when you're talking about the most valuable touches, which are receptions and goal line carries, those all went to Dari Gumbawale last year. You can get him in the 18th round. You can get him in for absolutely nothing, for peanuts. And if it doesn't work out, go ahead and drop him. Um, but if it does work out, you're getting a guy in the last round of your draft who is on a really good offense, who is a really good pass catcher, who could be a bigger version of James White at 5'11", 220 pounds. So 
Um, that's the kind of upside that you have with him for getting him for absolutely nothing for rounds that you're drafting guys like Joe Reed in the very last round. The read option. Hey, Blake, thanks for doing this. You're welcome. Uh, my question is, who are your guys and why? Uh, I'll read the rest of it here. In redrafts and best ball, who are the players you're coming away from drafts with the most shares of? Who are the players you're targeting, especially in the late rounds, and why? Thanks so much. Um, so I, I feel like a broken record here talking about it so many times. Um, so my, my guys are guys in gross situations who have the potential to break out there. Um, I would say in terms of players who aren't necessarily in the later rounds, um, tight end position, I'm really targeting a lot of TJ Hawkinson this year. Um, I think that TJ Hawkinson, at, I mean, as a rookie and playing such few games, he had uh, 400 yards. And I know that most people will say, okay, he had it against one game where he had over 100 yards um, against a not very good Cardinals team. And the thing is, I mean, most rookies aren't even able to put up that kind of yardage. I mean, we're drafting Hayden Hurst at number eight overall because he put because he's playing for the Falcons and he's never had a game where he's had over, I think it's like 50 yards thus far in his career. I know that there's a passing volume off, uh, um, issue over with the Ravens and you know, the most targets, whatever. We don't see many tight ends that put up those kind of numbers, especially in their rookie year. And now you're talking about a team who is funneling all their targets to a majority of two players. You have Marvin Jones and you have Kenny Galladay. They're soaking up like 90% of those targets there in Detroit. And now you have a player who is just as talented, or if not more talented, who's going to be soaking up a good amount of those targets as well. And so, and he has an incredible athletic profile. And uh, so he has a real capability of breaking out uh, in this second year on a team that's probably going to pass the ball quite a bit. So He's a guy that, and he has the potential to definitely be in the top five with his profile there. So that that's kind of where um, I'm at with, you know, a, a guy that I'm regularly coming away with and you can get him so cheap right now in terms of tight ends. I talked about some of the guys I'm targeting later. Ari Gumbawale, Jarek McKinnon, uh, Matt Breed is kind of in the middle rounds there. Um, I like Boston Scott quite a bit that I'm grabbing. Um I think he's going to have a lot of standalone value with Miles Sanders this year. So, John Snow again. Who are your must-have handcuffs this year um, in redraft that you do everything you can to make sure you draft if you have the starter for that team? So, I don't draft handcuffs, and I think what you're doing is you're really limiting your upside because you're taking away a roster spot from a player who could come in because because as long as you have that handcuff and he's not playing that means the starter is playing so you're having some guy on your bench who's not actually putting up any any points when you could have a player there who's potentially having the opportunity to break out so i guess the best way to do a handcuff is if you're going to take an opponent's handcuff right and so if one of their players goes down that hurts their team while bolstering your team so um i guess that's kind of the way i would look at it i'm not uh, necessarily drafting handcuffs in the way most people do, like drafting the best players, uh, like a Tony Pollard or an Alexander Madison and stuff like that. I'm not going out to grab those. I mean, their draft cap position right now, I mean, you can get players like Chase Edmonds and Boston Scott and all these guys who are going to have standalone value, who are actually going to be playing a pretty good, significant snap share. Um, you can get them after some of these handcuffs who aren't going to play a single down, uh, for these teams who have really high volume running backs who are being drafted in the first round. So um, I guess that's kind of the way I'd look at it. I'm not really grabbing handcuffs. I'd much rather take players who are having standalone value, Justin Jackson's, Boston Scott's, Chase Edmonds, uh, Duke Johnson's, uh, who have who are going to have standalone value and then could be breakout candidates should the uh, incumbent starter go down. Okay, ground fish. Which team's wide receiver two do you see delivering the most points to fantasy owners this year, and why? And why? Um, so the easy answer is Jarvis Landry. I think that's cheating, though. So I think when you're looking at wide receiver twos, you want to take a look at who is the wide receiver one, and are they... Are, are they an actual wide receiver one? Because when you're looking at these wide receiver twos, there are some wide receiver twos that can potentially take over the wide receiver one. That's when you kind of look at these 
guess the best way to put it is breakout wide receivers. And so just off the top of my head, um, sorry, I'm kind of filibustering here outside of Jarvis Landry. Um, so, I mean, Justin Jefferson has an opportunity to be really good. Uh, I guess that Rams, I mean, that entire Rams offense is so underrated right now. Um, so I guess Cooper Cup, Robert Woods, I guess they're both wide receiver ones and twos on that team. Um, over on the Texans, they don't really have, I guess, Will Fuller's kind of the wide receiver one, but uh, Brandon Cooks is the wide receiver two at that point, and he's been nothing but productive throughout his career, which is a health issue at this point. Um, so I'm trying to think of something off the top of my head, but that's what you, when, when you're looking at a wide receiver two to pick up for your team, you want to look at those that don't necessarily have an established wide receiver one who can kind of take over that role in a high volume way. Um, because the best way to wide receiver production is through volume. So um, that's, that's the way I'd kind of look at it and always draft Christian Kirk. That's where, that's where I'm at with that. Um, opinions on Herndon this season from Blaint. Given the news, he's their starting tight end. Um, doesn't really mean much to me. Uh, Herndon's a fine player. I, I think that he'll end up being a fine talent in the NFL. Um, I mean, you know how many breakout tight end candidates there are this season? Um, TJ Hawkinson, Noah Fant, Hayden Hurst, uh, Dallas Goddard, Irv Smith, Mike Jacecki. This goes on and on and on. Um, there are too many tight end breakout candidates on decent teams who I've seen uh, have the potential to break out. Um, and I'm willing to miss out on Herndon to dr- grab one of those guys. Uh, if that means I don't end up with the Jets tight end. Um, I, I don't, I think that team's going to be awful. Uh, I, I, I've created a Monte Carlo simulation that did 10,000 simulations of the season. And I don't see the Jets getting over six wins. Uh, I, I see them well under that. I, I, could, I mean, there, there's potential for them to win two, three games this year. So uh, I'm, I'm not really interested in Herndon. And if I end up missing out on a player who's pretty good because of that, um, I'll take my risk on that. Who scores more points, half PPR? Oh, Jar- Jarwin's another player. I forgot about as a potential breakout candidate. Uh, more points, half PPR, Jarwin or Herndon? Um, I'm going to go with – that's a really good question. I think that it's going to be Blake Jarwin, and I think there's going to be a higher probability of that just because he's been on the field the last year. Um so the, the best way to understand future productivity is previous productivity. And I know Herndon had a pretty good rookie season, but he hasn't been on the field at all uh, since then. And I guess if you're talking about just pure probability standpoint, like Jarwin is going to be on a high volume attack and teams are really going to hone in on their top receivers. Um, Dallas is going to throw the ball a ton. I think Jarwin's going to have a ton of opportunity there. Um, and I, as I said, I just hate that Jets offense and I'm not betting on any of those pieces there. Uh, maybe Le'Veon Bell just from pure volume standpoint. Um, but other than that, I'm not really interested in anything that's going on there. So, uh, if, if I had to put money down on it, I would, I would bet money on Jarwin. Uh, from Blaint, with all the rookie RBs being drafted and capable of taking over the RB1 role at their designated team, which rookie RB is most likely finishing off the season as the RB1 of their team? Um, okay, so I'm going to exclude uh, Clyde edwards Hilaire and Jonathan Taylor from this discussion. And so that is going to leave us with DeAndre Swift. That's going to leave us with Cam Akers. Um, that's going to leave us with Keyshawn Vaughn and J.K. Dobbins. And so if you're going to have me bet money on it, you want to look at... As as I've as has kind of been a theme is a talent differential between that player and either the incumbent starter or the player that they're going to be competing with. And so I, when you're talking about who's going to be the RB one on their team, you have to, in my opinion, you have to look at Cam Akers in that situation. Daryl Henderson was horrific last last year, and I think that Memphis running backs are starting to kind of show that it may be a little scheme based uh, in terms of how productive the running backs are. I know that there's another one uh, who's coming out next year, a Memphis running back who's supposed to be just as good as all the other ones. But uh, Daryl Henderson didn't look good last year. He 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 didn't show any sort of vision. Uh, I mean, the only thing that he really showed was his ability to. Um, 
the number one metric that he was out, I think, was uh, actually yards created uh, in that sense. So I think he was pretty good from that standpoint. But everything else, he was super inefficient at what he did. Um, Cam Akers, in, in terms of what the Rams have left behind, is a lot of vacated uh, opportunity. And I think that he has the talent profile to step in and soak up some of that opportunity there um, with a player who is as inefficient as Daryl Henderson was last year. Uh, I think DeAndre Swift also has a really good shot at it um, for, from that standpoint, because I, I don't actually believe in the talent of Carrion Johnson. I don't think that uh, DeAndre Swift has much to worry about there. It's just a matter of how competent is Matt Patricia and being able to distribute both of them. Uh, and how much work is he going to split it up just for splitting up work? Um, I think J.K. Dobbins is going to take a little while. Mark Ingram really has a good thing going there. He really, and that's kind of a narrative-based thing. I like J.K. Dobbins in town a lot, but uh, Mark Ingram is pretty established there, and I think it'll be a committee for until at least next year. And uh, Keyshawn Vaughn, the reports out of camp has been that he's not looked good so far, and so I'm I'm just staying away from that situation altogether. Uh, Inke, I'm sorry if I mispronounce that, Inke, uh, will Aaron Jones' workload regress significantly or just his TDs? I'm having trouble finding reason why he won't repeat last year's production, uh, but just with less touchdowns. That's a really good point, and I think that when you're looking at the things that he's good at, uh, he had a really high-weighted opportunity. So he actually caught a lot of passes last year, too, and actually one of the most efficient uh passes for Green Bay last year when they had the highest expected points added was when they actually passed the ball to Aaron Jones. Aaron Jones is actually one of the one of three running backs last year who had a positive expected points added when he ran the ball. So not just catching the ball, but running the ball. That's almost unheard of. And so the thing about Aaron Jones is I think over the last few years, you've kind of seen Green Bay doesn't really like him that much. I don't know why. It could be because he can't pass block. Um, I don't know if there's other things he has seen going on, uh, but every single aspect of his game points that he should have a significant workload, uh, but they just don't seem to ever want to give that to him. So, yes, his touchdowns are going to decrease just purely based off of his, where his touches occurred last year, how many, how many points he should have had. He should have had, like, 48 less points uh, than he had last year. Um, but will his workload regress? Even if it doesn't, his efficiency may regress, and that may be something to take a look at because he, he's been hyper-efficient these last few years. And so if his efficiency goes down in a little bit, you're going to see a really big drop in terms of his yardage. Um, there's not many good wide receivers there, though. So, I mean, in terms of how many targets he's going to get, I think it's probably going to be pretty sustainable. So um, I'm personally not drafting him where he's being drafted at. But that's not to say, I, and if I had to put money on it, uh, probabilistically, as, I don't even know if that's a word, uh, he's not going to sustain anything close to what it was last year. Do you think that Chris Godwin and Mike Evans are going to put up the same yards as they had without Jameis Winston and having a QB that likes tight ends in town? Um, I don't know if I believe in the tight end narrative. I think when you have a tight end like Rob Gronkowski, uh, you do like the tight end. Um, and so... As I kind of talked about before, the reason Chris Godwin and Mike Evans had the season they did is because they didn't have much target competition. I mean, they had O.J. Howard and Cameron Brait, who didn't really do much, um, and then Scotty Miller and Justin Watson. So all the targets are funneled into these two hyper-talented guys on a guy who's throwing 50, 60 times a game. Um, they're both really, really good players, but all of that's dependent on the amount of volume that they're going to be getting on a regular basis. As mentioned before, I don't think the Buccaneers are going to throw as much I don't think they're going to have as many yards. I think they're going to be super efficient in what they do. Um, Chris Godwin had one of the top five most efficient wide receiver seasons in history in terms of his expected points added per target and his uh, first downs per reception. So um, I, that has to come down. And uh, Mike Evans, I, I think there's a real true opportunity that he gets his first under 1,000-yard season in his career. Uh, based on the amount of volume he has. That's kind of my hot take for the year. But um, no, I don't think they're going to get anything close to what they have had. Who's going to take the workload in Denver now that Melvin Gordon has got, gotten there? Will Lindsey put up 1,000 rushing yards or will Gordon get more? So there's been kind of this talk lately that uh, Gordon and Lindsey are going to share a workload. And I think if that ends up happening, there are going to be a lot of people that are fired 
there in Denver because they just paid quite a bit of money for Melvin Gordon to go there. And if they're just going to keep giving the workload to an undrafted free agent in Philip Lindsay, I think there are going to be people who are going to have to answer some questions about that. I think Lindsay is pretty talented as a running back, even though he's not really a pass catcher. I think that's kind of a fallacy. Um, he, he's perceived as a pass catcher because he's kind of small and quick, but he's not really that great at it. I think Royce Freeman was actually more of the pass catching running back there. Um, and so if I, will Lindsay put up a thousand rushing yards? No, um, he's not going to get a thousand rushing yards. I think Melvin Gordon, regardless of what's kind of coming out of camp, I think that he's going to be a workhorse back on that team. Um, if he comes out and doesn't look very efficient, then, you know, there could be more of a split, but Melvin Gordon's still going to get the goal line carries. Um, at the end of the day, I, I think there's going to be too much opportunity for Melvin Gordon um, for him not to have a decent year. Tater Nanner 23. Uh, I have four minutes. I got to start plowing through these things. How do you feel about big boy AJ Dillon? Do you see him living up to the level of hype? His muscular frame has elevated to him, especially in dynasty leagues, or do you think he's mostly just hype? I think it's a little bit of both. Um, I, I, as I said before, I don't think running back talent has a whole lot of necessarily dictating factors on what type of opportunity they get. I think that Matt LaFleur has shown that he's kind of egotistical in terms of his decision-making. Um, and he's ready to kind of bring in his own regime into the into the frame. I don't think they re-sign Aaron Jones next year. I think that's going to open the door for A.J. Dillon to come in and have a decent workload. What he does with that, I'm not really sure, but I'm willing to take a shot on a guy who you're getting for at pretty much nothing at this point and who a lot of people are down on. Uh, and the minute he steps into the starting role, his value goes up immensely. So that's kind of how I'm treating it. How do you feel about Mike Williams this season? Do you think he can get 1,000 receiving yards again? Um. No, so I love Mike Williams, actually. I, I think he's actually a pretty decent talent uh, for someone we've kind of been down on the last few years. Um, but Tyra Taylor's not making this very easy for me to get on board with, or the Chargers offense in general. I think they're going to be one of the run-heaviest team in the league. I think they're going to be super slow. And I think Mike Evans' average depth of target was about 16 yards last season. That's absolutely unheard of. He was so far and ahead of everyone else in terms of average depth of target. He only had 50 yards or 50 receptions and he had over a thousand yards. So that's not happening again. And I don't think he's going to get nearly as much volume as he did last year uh, with about 90 targets last year. And he's not going to get very quality targets either, uh, especially with Hunter Henry coming back. Austin Eckler's going to get a ton of receptions. I think Justin Jackson's going to get a lot of receptions this year. So um, I, I like Mike Williams a lot. I just don't think this is going to be the year uh, for him to get that thousand yards. Do you think Joe Burrow will end up being a top 10 QB in his rookie season? Uh, and do you think Joe Mixon will hit 1,700 all-purpose yards this season? Um, so I don't really evaluate – and quarterback evaluation is one of those things where it's like, okay, we have a whole bunch that are in a pretty good pretty good group there in a pretty good tier. Um, so I'm going to draft one of these that kind of fit that mold. Uh, some of them ha have higher upside than others. Uh, you just kind of have to base it on where you believe that upside lies. I mean, Joe Burrow has a lot of upside. I think he has a lot of good rushing potential. Um, so, yeah, I think he has uh, – do I think he'll end up as the top 10 QB? No, I, I, I don't think that's very likely. Um, does he have the opportunity? Yes, I do. Uh, will Joe Mixon hit 1,700 all-purpose yards this season? Um, I'm not going to trust Joe Mixon until he actually does something. Uh, his first-round draft capital feels insane to me for a guy who hasn't done anything. I know that, um, and by not done anything, he has yet to be a very consistent RB1 for someone who's getting drafted as high as he is in the first round. Um, so I'm not getting burned by Joe Mixon this season, guys. Um, I'll start scrolling down a little bit here. Uh, Sutton has looked very good this season. We talked about Sutton a little bit. I'm going to keep going. Um, what stats do you find to be most predictive for future production? A lot of people like uh, Whopper weighted opportunity performance rating, and other opportunity-related stats, but it's hard to say whether they're going to get that same opportunity given the massive annual personnel change on NFL teams. So this is a really good question, Sam. Um, I appreciate you asking that because th this is a lot of people that people run into a lot. Um, so as I said before, the most predictive stat of opportunity for the following season is opportunity in previous seasons. So it, it's... Oh, alarm. Uh, it's, it's hard for anyone... 
to, I mean, so you can predict about up to a 40% confidence level. So when we're putting together these stats to predict future opportunity, uh, we're, we're probably predicting at about a 40 to 60% at most. And then everything else is just variance in between. So when you're looking at these things and you're talking about personnel changes on NFL teams, um, it's much more advantageous for you to feel comfortable with a player that's going to get opportunity with past opportunity. So weighted opportunity performance rating is a really good indicator of that. Um, so weighted opportunity performance rating is how their, their target market share plus their air yards market share combined into a single stat. So um, look at, looking at metrics like that and looking at their uh, I guess, as I said, their talent profile comparatively to the other options on the team, that can give you a good idea of how the distribution is going to go. Um, DJ Weez, you can just give me the code for Nitro now, but how on earth do you deal with such shitty takes all day? This is a round statement, not into anyone's of that. Um, <laughs> it, it's hard sometimes. Uh, there, there are some things that people put out there and you just, you just roll your eyes on. Some people I even really respect too. Um, what is the best strategy such as zero RB, zero wide receiver balance to orient your draft? And how does it depend on scoring and pick order? This year, it seems mostly take top running backs early, leaving late rounds thin at immediate useful running backs. But could it just be, if not more profitable, to take top wide receivers and ride waivers to fill running back spots throughout the season as necessary? So let, this is something that I've kind of been thinking about a lot. And there have been a lot of people that I really respect in the industry who are putting out, and I'm sure you guys have seen it, uh, they're putting out articles about win rates like best ball win rates and when you draft players to get a certain win rate and my issue with that is you're taking data from previous years so you're taking last year's data and two years ago and three years ago and what you're doing is you're creating this pattern this this draft pattern based on previous years to predict how you should do future events and the issue with that is we don't have last year's players in those draft orders this year so i don't understand why we're feeling like we need to utilize previous year's win rates based on who was where in the draft and where we drafted certain positions to try and tailor a draft strategy this year because you know like a couple years ago we got todd Gurley in the third round so yeah drafting wide receiver in the first or second round and then waiting until the third round to pick a running back was advantageous because if you had todd Gurley, you're winning that league and a few years ago, you could get Justin Forsett in the second round. So if you drafted a running back in the second round, you ended up losing. So, I mean, it's it's just one of those things where um, when, when you're trying to utilize uh, kind of cookie cutter, where to, who to draft what where uh, based on previous year's performances, that's a losing strategy. And so based on kind of what you were saying, and as I was saying earlier, um, so I agree with your ideology to fill RB spots throughout the season and take top wide receivers early. But what you're doing is you're putting yourself as a, in a disadvantaged spot because, as I said, the tiers are converging or diverging in terms of running backs. And so if you're not getting one of those top running backs, you're going to be at a huge disadvantage when all these guys are going off, not getting injured, and you're stuck with some of these scrubs out here. Um, okay, so what's been – the most rewarding aspect of being a prominent figure in the fantasy football community, having a platform to reach out to people. What would be some advice you'd give to someone who is interested in creating their own projections and platform in this uh, certainly unique but fun fantasy community? So the most rewarding aspect is, um, so it's an amazing community and meeting different people uh, with all different, I mean, the thing about it is most people in the fantasy football community, this isn't their full-time job, right? They're, they're doing this as a hobby. Uh, they're, you know, spending time away from their family to work on projections. Uh, they're working outside of work. They're working really hard hours and then coming home and working on fantasy football stuff. And so everyone kind of shares that common ground. And so getting to hear a lot of people's stories on what they're doing um, has been really cool uh, for me to get to meet a lot of these people and kind of the, what they're sacrificing in order to do that. Um, it, you know, people are out here really grinding. And so I, I give my hats off to so many different people in this community. Um, what are some advice you'd give to someone who's interested in creating their own projections? Um, don't be afraid to reach out to people. Um, you don't know everything. I don't know everything. Uh, there are people out there that are way smarter than me. And I, I've never had any issue with reaching out to someone and asking a question and they wouldn't be willing to help me out. Um, so never, never feel uncomfortable about asking people questions because there are so many people who are willing to 
to help you out in that sense. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and kind of scroll down here a little bit to the bottom here. Um, let's see. Um, what's crazy bold wide receiver prediction, one breakout candidate bold prediction, and one big regression candidate for wide receiver? Um, I think my big regression candidate is Tyler Boyd. I know some people are excited about him. Um, I was excited about him at one point until I started diving into the numbers. Uh, he had like 1,047 receiving yards last year, and he had and he got that, and he had to have 148 targets to get there. Um, that math's not adding up very well. He's not going to get 148 targets ever again in his career. Uh, so I, I don't see him getting anywhere close to that. And he's getting drafted or kind of around that range where he was last year. So took him 148 targets to end up as like the wide receiver 18. Um, I'm not interested in that. Uh, crazy bold wide receiver prediction. Allen Robinson's top five wide receiver. Uh, my breakout candidate, um, Brandon Ayuk. I think that that's kind of an easy one, but uh, I think he can have a really great first year. Um, from Sam, what's one thing you've recently learned uh, that you wish you knew when you first entered the fantasy industry? Um, oh, that's, that's a good one. I One of the things I, I wish I knew is that you don't necessarily need, you, you want to be able to have kind of a plan. Um, everything I do is kind of, I, I think when people say their brand, uh, I, I don't necessarily, I think that's kind of dumb when they say that. Uh, just kind of my perception, but you do. I mean, everyone kind of has their own brand and making sure that you're kind of tailoring everything you do to kind of match what that brand is, is important because you want, you kind of want to be known for something, right? Uh, because there, there are so many people that this is such a diluted industry in terms of people and content they're putting out. There's a lot of smart people. So what differentiates you from everyone else? Uh, as you want someone to know you associated for something. So kind of keep that in mind when you're kind of building this thing up, when you're putting out content, when you're kind of creating what you are uh, in your own lab space, um, what, what you want that brand to look like. I'm going to snag a couple more here uh, before, before we hop off here. Um, since we haven't seen them yet, what kind of dogs do you have? And can we see them? That's a great question. Um, I'm, I'm going to, Hey, Ghost, is it okay if I go grab one real fast? Do I have time for that? Okay, if I don't, I'll show them next time. I'll, maybe I'll put a picture. Huh? I, I actually, I'll just put it up on Twitter at some point. Um, so keep them. I have, I have three corgis at home. Um, they're, my, my wife and I, we don't have kids. Uh, we, we still got a couple years before that. But um, corgis are our children, and uh, they're, they're our absolute lives. So. Um, that is the type of dogs we have, and I'll, as I said, I'll put a picture up of them on Twitter. Um, Mike Evans, six straight thousand yard receiving. What's his ceiling this year? Um, ceiling, twelve hundred yards, ten touchdowns, um, which is not great in my opinion. Um, how do you explain your league that a trade calculator is not the best judge, good or bad trade? Yeah, so a trade calculator doesn't take into account your situation um, with your roster. Uh, you don't know, it doesn't know if you're in a rebuild. If, I mean, some of them may, but I haven't seen anything that indicates whether you're in a rebuild or not. So even though a trade calculator may tell you you're losing a trade, it may be best for your team in the long run. All right, so I scroll down. Uh, guys, so I'm going to go ahead and get off here. Um, thank you. So this was a lot of fun. Um, if I didn't get to your question and you, you'd like me to still answer them, uh, as I said, my Twitter is at Blake A. Hampton. Please feel free to reach out. I try to get to as many as I can. If I don't see it the first time, please message me again. You're not bothering me. Um, I, I'm just busy sometimes. So uh, I will get to your question. Sorry I couldn't get to all of it. I appreciate you guys more than anything. This is such an awesome community. Appreciate everything you do, Space Ghost Force. Um, and look forward to it next time, guys.